This is Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. Welcome to Open Book, Episode 8, How to Read Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote, Part 1. I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary, and today's topic is the first part of the first novel ever written, Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote, 1605, in which a mild-mannered Spanish aristocrat, bored with his life, decides to imitate the wandering knights of medieval romance. In this episode, I'll focus on the two bookends of Part 1 of Don Quixote, that is, the first ten chapters and then the last five. I'll also discuss the prologue, in which Cervantes sets out his purpose in writing the novel. So, this episode won't cover the entirety of Part 1, which consists of 52 chapters published in 1605. To clarify, those 52 chapters of Part 1 are themselves divided into four parts. But a decade later, in 1615, Cervantes published a sequel consisting of 74 additional chapters. And that sequel is now commonly referred to as the second part of Don Quixote, as it was published. And they will be the subject for a future episode in this series. I'll cover six topics in this episode. The first is the historical context and background to the 1605 part one. The second will be the life of Cervantes, 1547 through 1616. The third, I will talk about the context of Cervantes' sources, his romances, and his response, that is, he will write a realist novel. Fourthly, I'll address Cervantes' language, which is, even at a distance of 400 years, quite accessible. Uh, fifthly, I'll talk about Don Quixote's actual quest and the structure that it follows, which is very episodic. And finally, we'll look at Don Quixote's character and ask whether or not he is mad. A question many other characters ask in the course of their encounters with him. So, let's begin with the historical context. The first part of Miguel de Cervantes' novel, Don Quixote, was published in Madrid in 1605, and it was an immediate success. There were pirated editions of the book almost right away, and there were unauthorized continuations of the story. Within that first year of its publication, there were no fewer than five editions of Don Quixote in print. The novel was being read all over Europe, as far away even as Peru in the New World. Spanish editions were printed in France, Italy, and the Low Countries, and many translations followed. In 1612, for instance, it was translated into English, into French in 1616, into Italian in 1625, into Dutch in 1657, and into German in 1669. This is a pretty surprising response to a novel about a very unlikely hero. Don Quixote is the story of an impoverished country gentleman who probably, possibly goes mad from reading too much and decides that he's going to put the world to rights by becoming a knight errant. Throughout this episode, I'll be using Edith Grossman's 2003 translation published by HarperCollins, on page 20 of which we learn that, quote, this aforementioned gentleman spent his times of leisure, which meant most of the year, reading books of chivalry with so much devotion and enthusiasm that he forgot almost completely about the hunt and even about the administration of his estate. And in his rash, in his rash curiosity and folly... He went so far as to sell acres of arable land in order to buy books of chivalry to read, and he brought as many of them into, as he could into his house. Chivalry, by the way, refers to knights on horseback, the origin of that word being chevalier, which is a, the, word, the French word for a horseback rider. And these knights wander around 
uh, performing virtuous deeds, rescuing maidens in distress, fighting against monsters, acting in the service of their ideals. They have extraordinary adventures, and as Cervantes tells us, they also speak in quite elaborate language. Clearly, these are works of fantasy, but Don Quixote, as we learn on page 21, takes them very seriously. Quote, Our gentleman became so caught up in reading that he spent his nights reading from dusk till dawn, and his days reading from sunrise to sunset. And so, with too little sleep and too much reading, his brains dried up, causing him to lose his mind. His fantasy filled with everything he had read in his books, enchantments as well as combats, battles, challenges, wounds, courtings, loves, torments, and other impossible foolishness. And he became so convinced in his imagination of the truth of all these countless grandiloquent and false inventions he read that, for him, no history in the world was truer. That conviction is certainly the clearest evidence that Quixote has in fact lost his mind because the stories consist of such extraordinary and unlikely and fantastical events like giants and castles and enchantments and Quixote is incapable of discerning that they are not part of the real world. Further down on page 21, we learn what Quixote decides he is going to undertake. When his mind was completely gone, Cervantes writes, he had the strangest thought any lunatic in the world ever had, which was that it seemed reasonable and necessary to him, both for the sake of his honor and as a service to the nation, to become a knight errant and travel the world with his armor and his horse to seek adventures and engage in everything he had read that knights errant engaged in, righting all manner of wrongs, and, by seizing the opportunity and placing himself in danger and ending those wrongs, winning eternal renown and everlasting fame. The first thing I'll say about that quotation is that the concept of a knight errant, E-R-R-A-N-T, means is derived from the Latin verb errare, E-R-R-A-R-E, which literally means to wander. A wandering knight thus travels around, doing the things that Cervantes has mentioned, that Quixote has read, and consequently wins for himself eternal fame, eternal notoriety, something that Don Quixote, living in a quiet way is never going to achieve in his own life. And so the entirety of Don Quixote, the novel, is based on his delusional chivalric ideals, which are often resisting uh, in contest with the humdrum reality and the, the views of Quixote's more earthbound companion, Sancho Panza, whom we'll come to in a bit. So, let us now turn to the historical context and look at how it was that Cervantes' work and the world of 17th century Spain were related to one another. The context here is that 17th century Spain is the end of what's often called the Golden Age of Spain. That's a moment when uh, it enjoyed its extraordinary overseas empire. It very nearly took over the British Isles, for instance, in 1588. Spain was a fantastically wealthy country. It and Portugal sent ships away to India, China, Japan, the Spice Islands, which are now part of Indonesia, and this trade resulted in enormous quantities of wealth arriving in in Spain in the golden age of the 16th century. Uh, it, most of that time it was also ruled over by a stable monarch, Philip II. But within Spain in the 16th century there were also social tensions, particularly toward the end of that century. There were plagues, there were military defeats, and the mood in Spain was changing and becoming a bit more pessimistic, particularly in its problematic relationship between a glorious past and a debased or diminished present. <laughs> 
The life of Miguel de Cervantes, which began in 1547 and ended in 1616, was quite varied, intense and adventurous for the first half when he was a man of action, a soldier, a hero in battle. But in the second half, it was a life of penury and failure and yet literary greatness. He was born in 1547 outside of Madrid, the son of a barber surgeon. He probably didn't go to university, but his father had a vast book collection, which was quite unusual for the time. Cervantes developed an appetite for reading and for travel. In 1569, he spent six years in Italy and read classics and modern Italian literature before enlisting in a Spanish regiment as a way to escape, to see the world and travel. He got the adventure he was looking for in 1575 when he was captured by Muslim Barbary pirates and sold into slavery in Algiers. He spent five years there, but organized various escape attempts, and his heroism was undimmed. Finally, he was ransomed, incurring a huge debt for his family, and in 1580 he returned to Spain, where the second part of his life began, a life of penury and impoverishment in which he was burdened by debt and tried everything he could to earn a living. He first failed to write a romance, to write plays. He tried to build a career in low-level administration, applying unsuccessfully for a post in America, for example. In the 1590s, he became a tax collector. All of Cervantes' major works were produced after he quit government work in the last 16 years of his life. And he lived the life of a professional writer in this period when there were no royalties, no advances, no copyright, no fac faculty positions in creative writing programs, for instance. There was only patronage, that is, the support of rich or noble readers, some of whom would give you a pension, like a regular recurring payment. Others would just give you one-off support. But most of the patronage in Renaissance Spain went to printers, not to authors. Patronage was often based on literary success, like the number of copies that you sold, but it was just as often based on a writer's connections and their ability to approach and persuade these rich and noble readers. Cervantes actually received no royalties at all from Don Quixote, despite its enormous and immediate success, and he had only limited success finding a patron. Let's consider now how it was that Cervantes responded to romances, which he was reading, with a realist novel. He was evidently a very voracious reader, and his book as a whole is kind of a celebration of reading fiction, of reading domestic Spanish texts, especially romances of chivalry, tales of adventure, love, gothic horror, magic, and exotic travel. They were very appealing in his time. And Cervantes read quite widely in them. In the seventh chapter of part one, he actually names 31 separate novels, almost offering a bibliography for this novel. He's indebted to one in particular, which is saved from the fire quite early in this book, a book in which the knights actually die in their beds. It's the story of a knight who is very accident prone, who has a very pathetic ending and dies of illness. Renaissance readers of romance liked a huge variety of topics and subjects. Cervantes also offered a challenge to the literary past by writing Don Quixote, effectively saying, things that they can do, I can do better. He brings a kind of novelistic experimentation into his fiction. In the prologue to part one, he sets out pretty clearly that his goal is to undermine romances. He calls them inane books of chivalry. And on page eight of Edith Grossman's translation, he writes that since this work of yours, that is of Don Quixote, 
intends only to undermine the authority and wide acceptance that books of chivalry have in the world and among the public. There's no reason for you to go begging for maxims from philosophers, counsel from holy scripture, fictions from poets, orations from rhetoricians, or miracles from saints. In other words, you don't need any of this fancy, elaborate, extra stuff that you tend to find in non-realist books of the time, he says. Instead, you should strive in plain speech, with words that are straightforward, honest, and well-placed, to make your sentences and phrases sonorous and entertaining. Sonorous means beautifully so beautiful sounding. And have them portray as much as you can, and as far as it is possible, your intention, making your ideas clear without complicating and obscuring them. Another thing to strive for, reading your history should move the melancholy to laughter, increase the joy of the cheerful, not irritate the simple, fill the clever with admiration for its invention, not give the serious reason to scorn it, and allow the prudent to praise it. In short, keep your eye on the goal of demolishing the ill-founded apparatus of these chivalric books, despised by many and praised by so many more. And if you accomplish this, you will have accomplished no small thing. All of this emphasis on literary style demands a bit of explanation. Romances were commonly written in very elaborate language, so that in chapter 2, for instance, when Don Quixote departs on his first adventure, he narrates himself, he narrates his own experience in a way that is a deliberate parody, I should say Cervantes' deliberate parody, not the Don's himself, not Don Quixote's himself, a deliberate parody of their style. He says, just as they, he is departing, no sooner had Rubicund Apollo spread over the face of the wide and spacious earth the golden strands of his beauteous hair. No sooner had diminutive and bright-hued birds with dulcet tongues greeted in sweet mellifluous harmony the advent of rosy dawn, who, forsaking the soft couch of her zealous consort, revealed herself to mortals through the doors and balconies of the Manchegan horizon. Then, the famous knight Don Quixote of La Mancha, abandoning the downy bed of idleness, mounted his famous steed Rosinante, and commenced to ride through the ancient and illustrious countryside of Montiel. Cervantes has no patience for this elaborate style, these mythological allusions, these verbose descriptions. He is instead writing a realist romance, which is to say a novel, which is why it is so so unusual, so so novel to write something that is realistic in its descriptions. After all, we are not in the world of romance. We're in 17th century Castile, and all of the legacy of the medieval romances of these influential tales of chivalry, all the legacy exists only in Don Quixote's head, which is why people who greet him are often full of incomprehension. But we'll come to that in due course. First, look at on page 39 in chapter 4 how... Quixote operates along the lines of exactly what a chivalric romance knight would do. He arrives, for instance, at a road, and he can't decide where, which path to follow. There came to his imagine, the imagination the crossroads where knights errant would begin to ponder which of these roads they would follow. And in order to imitate them, he remained motionless for a time, and after having thought very carefully, he loosened the reins and subjected his will to Rosinante's. A very similar incident transpires on page 157 in chapter 21, in which Sancho finally just loses his patience. And his constant role, by the way, is to turn Don, return Don Quixote to reality. He says to Don Quixote, I've been thinking how little gain or profit there is in looking for the adventures that your grace looks for in these deserted places and crossroads, because even when you conquer and conclude the most dangerous, there's nobody to see them or to know about them. And he continues a bit further down, it would be better, unless your grace thinks otherwise, if we went to serve some emperor or some other great prince who's involved in some war. A bit further down, there's sure to be somebody there who'll put into writing 
your grace's great deed so they can be remembered forever. That is, after all, an implicit intention of going on these adventures that is to be remembered. And Ch Sancho's rational objections are constantly trying to uh, return Quixote's chivalric illusions to the everyday reality. In chapter 10, page 73, he speaks of how they have to suffer, quote, so many inconveniences and discomforts, like sleeping in our clothes and sleeping in the open and a thousand other acts of penance contained in the vow of that crazy old man, the Marquis of Mantua, which your grace wants to renew now. That is the immediate mission that they are on. So that contest between the chivalric and the everyday, between the illusions and the reality, is very much the same contest as exists between the romance and the novel. The romance is not realistic. On page 74, still continuing with chapter, chapter 10, uh, Quixote says to Sancho that he has read many romances and he cannot he cannot follow the advice that Sancho is giving him because he's never read of a knight doing any of the th things Sancho wishes him to do. He says, It is a question of honor for knights errant not to eat for a month, and when they do eat, it is whatever they find near at hand. And you would know the truth of this if you, have read, if you had read as many histories as I, although there are many of them. In none have I found it written that knights errant ever ate, unless perhaps at some sumptuous banquet offered in their honor, the rest of the time they all but fasted. Earlier in chapter 6, there's a conversation between a priest and a barber about the, uh, certain romances being better than others. And on page 50 in chapter 6, the priest refers to the one I, I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast about the knights who die in their bed. Tyrant Le Blanc is what it's called. History of the famous knight Tyrant Le Blanc. And we learn about it, that its style, at the top of page 50, it is the best book in the world. Why? In it, the knights eat and sleep and die in their beds and make a will before they die and do everything else that all the other books of this sort leave out. What makes that so unusual is that a romance is not a place for realism. A romance is defined as a fictional story, either in prose or in verse, that tells improbable adventures of idealized characters in some remote or enchanted setting. And more generally, it's a, it has a tendency in fiction that is completely the opposite of realism. The novel, on the other hand, is far more realistic. It is an extended fictional prose narrative, but it differs from the prose romance in that so much more realism is expected of it. It tends also to describe a very recognizable secular social world, which is often in a, in a much more skeptical and a prosaic manner, inappropriate to the marvels of romance. So all of these realist impulses that Sancho and the priest here represent are novelistic impulses. Cervantes, therefore, is writing a, an anti-romance, or more specifically, he is writing a realist romance, or more specifically, he is writing a novel. He claimed, in fact, I am the first who has written novels in the Spanish language. A word before we go on about Cervantes' language. It's not just in uh, Edith Grossman's lovely translation that you see this. It's also in the original book itself that Cervantes' language on the whole is quite accessible. It doesn't feel like you're reading something that is 400 plus years old. He writes in a quite vernacular, accessible style. It's a very eloquent and clear book. In part two, Sancho Panza and Don Quixote actually discuss the book itself on page 478 of this edition. They say, It is so clear that there is nothing in it to cause difficulty. Children look at it, youths read it, men understand it, the old celebrate it. In short, this history is the most enjoyable and least harmful entertainment ever seen. <laughs> 
And yet Cervantes also is extraordinarily eloquent. He gives Sancho Panza beautifully written things to say. For example, he has Don Quixote refer to the ideals of chivalry, of arms and letters. He compiles classical wisdom together. And the narrator often spends whole pages and pages just giving Sancho Panza and Don Quixote the ability to tell the story. He stands back from the, the action. I've said a great deal so far about the action of this novel without actually describing much of the action of this novel. So let's look now at what quest it is Don Quixote is following, what structure it follows, what outcome it imagines. I already quoted the lines on in chapter 1 on page 21 about how he wishes to become a knight errant, travel the world with his armor and his horse, to seek adventures and engage in everything he had read that knights errant engaged in, writing all manner of wrongs, and etc., winning eternal renown and everlasting fame. That's his driving ambition. Uh, later in chapter 3, he refers to, he describes his quest a bit more directly. He says, I needs must travel the four corners of the earth in search of adventures on behalf of those in need, this being the office of chivalry and of knights errant, for I am one of them, and my desire is disposed to such deeds. That's on page 30. Right at the beginning of chapter 2, on page 24, he, the narrator describes how Quixote believes there were evils to undo, wrongs to right, injustices to correct, abuses to ameliorate, and offenses to rectify. These form a code of chivalric knights. Don Quixote makes a very grand declaration in chapter 4, bottom of 37, pit top of 38, when he says, I am the valiant Don Quixote of La Mancha, the writer of wrongs and injustices. And well below that, at the bottom of 38, also a knight errant needs to be the lover of some beautiful lady. He refers to this, uh, as I say, in this quotation, well mayst thou call thyself the most fortunate of ladies in the world today. O oh, most beauteous of all the beauteous Dulcinea of Toboso. This is his chosen beloved. For it is thy portion to have as vassal and servant to thy entire will and disposition, so valiant and renowned a knight as Don Quixote of La Mancha. One of the conventions in medieval romance is for it to follow a very episodic structure. That is to say, it lends itself to a huge amount of variety of locations and events. And there is a sense of the cumulative growth or the accumulation of experiences as the knight wanders from place to place encountering different people. There are a number of very famous episodes in Don Quixote, so let's discuss the first two. But before I discuss them, I'd like to say a little bit about this problem of the illusions that are in Don Quixote's eyes and the reality in the world around him. There's a particular episode I'm thinking of that occurs in uh, chapter 18, page 126. There's a moment when Don Quixote looks over to see uh, a collection, two large flocks of ewes and rams that are traveling from opposite directions toward each other on a road. And Quixote, however, doesn't see what he sees. He doesn't see them as these animals. He sees instead this. At all times and at every moment, his fantasy was filled with the battles, enchantments, feats, follies, loves, and challenges recounted in books of chivalry, and everything he said, thought, or did was directed toward such matters. He is, in other words, capable only of seeing what he imagines. He believes that they are two armies coming to confront each other. And in many of these episodes, the reason that I set this up before we look at the famous episodes that come earlier in the book is that this moment reinforces the fact that the knight has almost a privileged vision although of course it's a deluded vision, that he's capable of seeing beyond a deceptively simple 
exterior appearance of seemingly ordinary events. The very first episode sees Don Quixote trying to construct himself a helmet because he doesn't have one, and so he makes and destroys one because it is made of cardboard. It's clearly inadequate to the task that he wants it to be ready for, to protect him. He makes and destroys it in a test of his strength. But the second cardboard helmet that he makes, he decides not to test accordingly. Why? Because he needs to impose his will onto reality right from the outset. Don Quixote's attitude in the most famous episode in all of his adventures is that things look a certain way, but that is merely an illusion. I'm referring, of course, to the incident in which he attacks the windmills. This is chapter 8. And he and Sancho see 30 or 40 windmills. Uh, and uh, Quixote declares that they are, quote, this is page 58, 30 or more enormous giants with whom I intend to do battle. Sancho then replies, what giants are you talking about? Look, Your Grace, those things that appear are not giants, but windmills. And Quixote's response is, thou art not well versed in the manner of adventures. He repeats that line again on page 62. It's, I have already told you, Sancho, you know very little about the subject of adventures. What I say is true, and now you will see that it is so. In other words, Quixote will do anything, say anything, in order to bend the world to his will, in order to uphold the belief that he has. There are a few words we could use for this. He is either idealistic, or devoted, or inspiring, or he is simply a raving lunatic, and we really have to decide as readers, whether we believe Don Quixote to be merely a little eccentric or truly mad. Cervantes has already, in quotes I've read, referred a few times to Don Quixote's madness. The question is, is Cervantes being credible? It's a bit like the question of Shakespeare's Hamlet, which, by the way, was published a year before uh, Don Quixote Part One. Is Hamlet truly mad, or is he, as Hamlet says, mad by craft, by design? Don Quixote's madness seems to be only in his tainted vision, only in his willingness to believe things. But like all inspired madmen, he also calls our own perceptions into question. Are those absolutely certainly windmills, or are they simply those things that we believe or deluded to believe are merely windmills? Does Quixote, in other words, have a privileged vision or a deluded vision? His so-called madness, by the way, may be simply eccentricity because it feels quite episodic. The answer, I think, is probably that Quixote suffers from what we might call literary madness. Cervantes spends a lot of time at the beginning of part one diagnosing Quixote's illness. He stays up far too late. He doesn't eat properly. He reads far too much. This is a warning to all obsessive students who neglect their health and their need for sunshine and exercise by working obsessively at certain enterprises or undertakings, whether they're scholarly or for entertainment, say, finishing a video game. The other form of this madness, this literary madness, uh, which leads him to neglect his own health and nutrition and so on, is that it is a device to parody chivalry itself. The first is the notion that this, the romances are literally true histories. The second madness is that he has been chosen by God or, or defined by destiny to restore that golden world to the debased and fallen present. Now, his belief in that does believe, begin to wane quite a lot in part two. But Quixote never, ever allows that these romances are fictions until he is lying on his deathbed right at the end of part two. 
We can also see in the ways that other people respond to Quixote, the variety of possible interpretations we might give to him. We are allowed to decide, that is, whether we believe he is being irritatingly mad or merely in a more indulgent way, just a mere eccentric. In uh, the end of chapter two, there's a response in an inn when a number of people react quite indulgently toward Quixote. Look on page 29. A gelder of hogs happened to arrive at the inn, and as he arrived, he blew on his reed pipe four or five times, which confirmed for Don Quixote that he was in a famous castle where they were entertaining him with music, and that the cod was trout, the bread soft and white, the prostitutes ladies, the innkeeper the castellan of the castle, and that his decision to sally forth had been a good one. But in other circumstances, other people who respond to Quixote are far less indulgent of his delusions. I'm thinking in chapter 3 of the mule drivers who attack him on page 33. Similarly, in chapter 8, uh, the friars attack him in response to uh, his approach. Many people are actually unsure how to decide, what, how to determine which way they ought to respond to Quixote, either to treat him with derision uh, or indulgence. Finally, let us look at the closing chapters of part one and consider how it is that Quixote thinks about how he is updating romances for a modern world, in a world in which he also can learn from other texts. At the start of chapter 47, in fact, he uses this term, perhaps in these our modern times, this is the bottom of 405, chivalry and enchantments follow a path different from the one they followed in ancient times. At another moment later in that chapter, a canon, who is like a form of priest, begins or offers a tirade against romances. This is on page 411. He says, the books called novels of chivalry are prejudicial to the nation. At the top of the next page, he says, although the principal aim of these books is to delight, I do not know how they can, being so full of so many excessively foolish elements. This is a challenge that... Quixote, in this tirade against romances, he's going to have to answer. But the canon anticipates something you might say in defense of romance when he says on 412, if one were to reply that those who compose these books write them as fictions and therefore are not obliged to consider the fine points of truth, I should respond that the more truthful the fiction, the better it is, and the more probable and possible, the more pleasing. Fictional tales must engage the minds of those who read them. And by restraining exaggeration and moderating impossibility, they enthrall the spirit and thereby astonish, captivate, delight, and entertain, allowing wonder and joy to move together at the same pace. None of these things can be accomplished by fleeing verisimilitude and mimesis, which are both terms that refer to the realism and the imitation of writing, which can together constitute perfection in writing. So he has a very clear view on this. Further down the page, he says, the style is fatiguing, the action incredible, the love lascivious, the courtesies clumsy, the battles long, the language foolish, the journeys nonsensical, and finally, since they are totally lacking in intelligent artifice, they deserve to be banished. The canon is making a very doctrinal argument, and the priest, in response, offers a spirited and strong, vigorous defense of romances. Later in this conversation on chapter 49, the canon actually questions Don Quixote on why he believes romances. On page 423, is it possible, senor, that the grievous and idle reading of books of chivalry could have so affected your grace that it has unbalanced your judgment and made you believe that you are enchanted along with other things of this nature, which are as far from being true as truth is from lies? He continues further down the page, I can say that when I read them, 
As long as I do not set my mind to thinking that they are all frivolous lies, I do derive some pleasure from them. But when I realize what they actually are, I throw even the best of them against the wall, and would even toss them in the fire if one were near, and think they richly deserve the punishment for being deceptive and false and far beyond the limits of common sense. Over the page, he urges Quixote to, quote, return to the bosom of good sense and learn to use the considerable intelligence that heaven was pleased to give you and devote your intellectual talents to another kind of reading that redounds to the benefit of your conscience and the increase of your honor. He then recites a long list of different history books that Quixote might read, and he concludes, This would certainly be a study worthy of your grace's intelligence, Senor Don Quixote, and from it you would emerge learned in history, enamored of virtue, instructed in goodness, improved in your customs, valiant but not rash, bold and not cowardly, and all of this would honor God and benefit you. Quixote's elaborate and quite spirited defense of romances is described on 427 as a mixture of truth and falsehood, and so it appears on 425. Well then, replied Don Quixote, it is my opinion, the one who is deranged and enchanted is your grace. He's speaking to the canon further down that paragraph, because wanting to convince anyone that there was no Amadis in the world. Amadis, by the way, is the Amadis of Gaul. He's the most famous Spanish chivalric romantic knight that Quixote admires and imitates. Wanting to convince anyone there was no Amadis in the world or any of the adventuring knights who fill the histories is the same as trying to persuade that person that the sun does not shine, ice is not cold, and that the earth bears no crops. And continuing further, if that is a lie, it must also be true that there was no Hector, no Achilles, no Trojan War, no Twelve Peers of France, no King Arthur of England who was transformed into a crow and whose return is awaited in his kingdom to this day. This is quite a mix of truth and falsehood together. He believes that the, there's a continuity between things written in histories and things written in the romances that provide some of the similar historical sounding details. Look at the beginning of chapter 50 on page 428. Can they possibly be a lie, Quixote asks, especially when they bear so close a resemblance to the truth? And tell us about the father, the mother, the nation, the family, the age, the birthplace, and the great deeds, point by point and day by day of the night or nights in question. In other words, how can there be so much detail that is pure fiction, pure invention? It's inconceivable that all of those details would merely be invented. They look, in other words, like a history looks. So they have the sorts of details that histories have. And at the same time, they offer vastly greater pleasures than any history is capable of offering. Look at page 430, when Quixote says, Anyone can read any part of any history of a knight errant, and from it derive great pleasure and delight. They drive away melancholy, they improve your spirits, he continues. But there's one final thing, one final quality, that is irresistible for him to raise, and that is the way that they improve your morals, your conduct, your character. For myself, he says, I can say that since I became a knight errant, I have been valiant, well-mannered, liberal, polite, generous, courteous, bold, gentle, patient, long-suffering in labors, imprisonments, and enchantments. And so, for the modern reader, although we know Quixote to be deluded, we also enjoy what the canon, or rather the narrator, describes in 431 as the reasoned nonsense, the the way that Quixote believes so ardently in these things to be morally improving, to be full of pleasures, to be so credible. We want, for his sake, them to be true. We want the illusion to be real. We want, in other words, to join Quixote on his quest, a quest for ideals in a degraded world.
been listening to Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. The next episode is on four 17th century metaphysical nature poems by George Herbert, Henry King, and Andrew Marvell. Meanwhile, you can search me up in the usual places. It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname U-L-L-Y-O-T, or go straight there by typing j.mp slash Elliot. You can also find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity. And then there's old-fashioned email, Elliot at ucalgary.ca. That's U-C-A-L-G-A-R-Y dot C-A. The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well-Tempered Clavier Project and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka. Mm-hmm.